thanks for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. I mean, you guys thanks for coming. Oh, God, <laughs> the last minute guys come. Yeah, it, it is kind of last minute. You know I was here, but it's okay. Some of the last minute ones end up being the best ones. For people out there listening, give me sort of like a brief background on who you are and uh, where you came from. So I'm I'm Ed Lattimore. I am I write a lot of material. I say my my motto on my website and for all the content I create is I take what I learned the hard way and I break it down so you can learn it the easy way. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I learned via, you know, the hard way, moderation and self-control, dealing with my alcoholism. I have a lot of articles about uh, dealing with that, becoming sober, becoming sober and socializing. Some of the things you'll have to face and deal with the demons that you may not be prepared for, prepared to deal with. Yeah. I'll write a lot about just improving yourself in general. I also write about growing on social media. My, we were just talking about the whole SEO idea. And to me, it seems like a really intuitive and automatic kind of thing. Like, okay, if I say a thing and I capture this attention and how do I make it grow? And I'm really big on doing it without being a troll. Like I don't talk about politics. I don't put people down. <laughs> I don't, I don't try to put any negativity out in the world. I'm a firm believer. And if you deliver value via entertainment or education, that people will come and find you. However, you have to have done the work to be a valuable person. So people don't just go, Oh, this is just another guy spouting off uh, timeless wisdom. Like, no, there's, it, yeah, <laughs> it's very oversaturated on social media right now with people, you know, being gurus of this, that, and the third freaking entrepreneurial <laughs> gurus, Gary V's, all those guys. There's yeah, just because, so many of them. Everyone wants to do it because they just see these guys saying these things and they forget. Like, I'm not like 100% familiar with like Gary V's story, mm-hmm. but I know that Gary V didn't wake up one day and go, I want to spout off a bunch of things and make money. He was like, no, nah, he wouldn't make money yeah. first right. and then came and said okay here's some lessons to take from it and decided that was a, another cool place he wants to mm. be and and i think that's just a natural extension of any type of hard work that a person does they end up there one way or the other because after you have done some things you get enough questions about said things and some people are motivated to teach uh, in one way or the other whether it be one-on-one or to a group there's always yeah. some way some uh some way you want to distribute value yeah you know, redistribute value i should say to people who you believe, you know, kind of helped you come up. But that's that's me on my website. Okay. And a lot of things that I did outside of that beforehand is we talked about, you know, how you gain this ability to say stuff that people mm-hmm. listen to and take seriously. I boxed professionally for six years, amateur for five before that. Wow. <clears throat> I had a great, great time, great career, especially as an amateur. I, th- I, I, had, I went further than I thought I would go as an amateur because I started – Late, I didn't walk into a gym until I was 22, which is ancient. But the advantage for is boxing that, that's ancient, right? That's, that's ooh, dinosaur. Man. <laughs> but the advantage is that I'm a heavyweight, and what people have to understand is if you start boxing when you're a kid and you just keep at it with the training and everything, you're probably not probably me. You just unless you're like six six or taller, you're not going to put the mass on uh, naturally. So mm-hmm. I was off doing other sports and getting stronger, and mm-hmm. I decided to go box. I mean, you look at the, the top guys, Deontay Wilder's older. I start, and started older than me at that, too. I believe that so is Joshua. Uh, the There's another another guy uh, out there. I can't remember his name right now. Mm-hmm. It'll come to me. Uh, but, there, but a lot of guys at the heavier weight divisions, they not only start later, but then they can last longer. One of my favorite guys that I watch who's – you know, recently is a guy named Amir Mansour. Amir Mansour was was killing guys, right? In yeah. The range, just just dropping them, and then unfortunately, Amir was out there doing some crimes and got got pinched, I believe, in something related to drugs. <laughs> yeah. And went away for ten years, didn't get out because I'm looking at his box record where you can see everyone's record. I'm like, man, what happened to Amir? <laughs> uh, it, ten years out, comes right back out at 37 and starts killing it. Fought till he was 45. Really? And, and wow. Did, and did a great job. It was, was yeah. I mean. The the only fights I saw him rightfully lose, may, maybe one. Uh, he lost one fight that would have got him a title shot because he bit through his tongue and just couldn't continue. Ooh, that that mm. kind of thing was awful. But yeah, when you when you start heavyweight boxing, you can go a little later. But mm-hmm. I didn't have any like natural athletic ability. I think and. I went went really far with that. I had a great time, and then I got my success as an amateur helped me move well as a pro. Mm-hmm. Until you know, I went went as far as I could at the time, and also while I was doing that, I was enlisted in the army because, and I enlisted because I figured I don't have any skills outside of boxing. Like I had just been, you know, I've been spending the past decade 
beating up people and not really gaining anything. And I know I can't beat up people forever. Not only that, but there's not that much money in the sport. People think right. we're getting paid. I mean, my highest payday was was not even five figures. I like to put that in perspective, and that's standard. I think Carl Frotch, he's a, a champion. He did some research on this and put it together, and he said that 97% of fighters are going to have to get a job really after they quit like and, and not Damn. just like oh they're not doing anything they know you, you got to get in. there's no no unions no one cares about the fighter it's a it's very much a gladiator kind of bottom of the barrel sport a lot of mm -hmm. gyms are in poor neighborhoods and that is not a coincidence it's right. cheap i mean what do you need you need gloves and, and <laughs> right. aggression i mean right. a ring is optional especially when you're coming up <laughs> as an amateur you know you compete in one but i've been to some gyms where like quite literally it's in a corner of a warehouse and someone took and used those two walls to the corner is, is, is two sides of the, the square and the other two they put some rope around and that, that was all they had so that you, you see that a lot in the, in the sport and i just i had an experience this one experience i was walking from the gym when i was an amateur and for whatever reason i left my phone and my ipod at home and that kept me looking forward so i could see when somebody's car came up and lost control off the sidewalk and i jumped out the way and i was like Huh, that was close. I could lose boxing at any time. Let me do something else with my life and start building that up. Plus, there was just the pain points and everything. So, you know, I went and got my degree in physics while I was busy being a pro and enlisted in the military. And I chose physics for, for lots of other reasons. Yeah, why, fi why physics? <laughs> that wasn't the original goal. The original goal uh, was, was math. And I chose math okay. because I thought that I was going to have to go to school or I thought I was going to have to work while I was boxing and go to school, right? So I'm already planning to be super busy. And what ends up happening is I go to the military. And and the reason I, I figure I'm busy is because there are going to be lab sciences and any other sciences. And I looked at, like, where all the high-paying jobs were, and they all needed math. So I yeah. said, okay, you got to learn math. That's just what's got to happen. I go and in my military, my occupational specialty, my MOS for the military was 94 Alpha. And that means I had to go do a lot of work with electronics. Mm. And as part of my training, I, I went through this thing called B-Man in Fort Lee, basic mechanical and electronic theory. And I was like, oh, this is even cooler. I think I want to be an electrical engineer. And all the engineers have to take physics. And so I take physics when I start class. And my first physics class, you got to do this thing with projectile motion. You got to pre predict where a, a pellet is going to land with no other forces acting on it but gravity and the initial like acceleration. Right. And it landed where I said it was going to land. And I said, yo, that's like magic. I want to do that instead. And so that's how I ended up there. I mean, it, it, that's pretty I, crazy. I, I stuck with it because I don't I don't really understand the idea of, of quitting. I understand being beat out of something. That's how I approached boxing. I said, I'm going to go as long as I can. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to have to tell me I suck or I'm going to have to get injured. Okay. And what ended up happening is I got injured as a pro. And then my coach was like, dude, my coach. Oh, he's like, man, you got, you're doing all this stuff. Your life is great. Why are you still here? Like, do you understand that, that every time you walk in the ring, you have a chance of being permanently altered in a way that can alter your life and not in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't say it exactly like that, but that's kind of how I filtered it. Mm -hmm. he basically, he's like, you know, I'm your friend. I care about you. I don't, you don't need to do this anymore. And so I walked away from that and really put a lot more energy into my website and into my mm -hmm. writing and things and, and my chess game too, which is your uh, chess game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I started, I started competing in chess uh, this year. That's sick. What? I, I saw that in a video. And, and I love, I love, I love chess. Right? We need to get a chess table here. I know we should have one. On we, table. I love playing chess. I suck yeah. so bad. Oh, I man. Love it. You know what? I, I'm like, I was like, well, and was progressing from you know where I was, where I'm now. Yeah. I, I really wanted to take it seriously. I'd always kind of just been playing on chess.com. So I said, okay, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna talk about chess on social media, and I'm always gonna say how much I love it, then I have to go. And start competing OTB over the board. So I started registering tournaments and working on my game. And then that led to me getting a, a coach who found out. And he is a great coach, Eric Kislik, for anybody listening who's looking for an okay. international master. He, he's gained that title. And he's really he, – 
he, I understand the game better. Like, like I, I just, I mean, I told him what was wrong. I was like, well, this is where I'm frustrated, and I don't know what to do here, and I feel lost when these things come up. And he was like, it's okay. <laughs> breaks, <laughs> and he breaks. He's got all these because because a good teacher gets used to seeing the same problems in the students yeah. over and over again. And he in chess, it was no different. He actually had. This thing drawn up is like, here's what you're going to do in the semi-open and open positions. Ask yourself these questions. See what it looks like here. And I'm like, and it changed my entire way of looking at the game. Because before I was like, I make this move. And then he makes that move. And I had, I kind of had an idea that there was a, a strategy element, a planning element. But I didn't really get it. And now I see because no one's looking far ahead. I mean, I, I can't remember what Grandmaster said it. But, but a famous quote is, I don't look three moves ahead, I think about the next move and I make the correct move every time. And I was like, wow, that's that's profound. And that's what it is because I'm I'm looking at the game and I'm going, okay, I see all of this stuff. What do I focus on? And Eric's work gave me a way to look at the game and go, I can focus on it. So now my my chess.com ratings are all over 15, one is over 16. And that's good. Okay. That's, that's like, you know, my 30-minute game, my three-day game, yeah. my, my blitz game in 10, 10 or 5 minutes. And it'll keep getting stronger because I know it's not going to, you know, happen overnight. And I'll get as good as I can. Maybe maybe my limit is like 1,800 and I'll never get a title. Uh, or maybe I could be a GM. Yeah. I don't know. I probably can't be a GM. GM. Those guys mean... Phew. Dude. We used to play with this guy. There was a guy across the street from our old office in St. Petersburg. Uh, this guy, he would he would come and hustle me playing chess. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> I, his name was Larry. Shout out to Larry. Um, and he'd make me buy him. I don't I forgot. What did I buy him? Like we'd cigarettes? Just buy a beer. He, I'd buy, he'd if, buy me, if, I'd like, if he beat us, if, we would have to buy him a beer from the store. If I beat you, <laughs> you got you to buy time. me a beer. That's what it would be. And, yeah. and the dude, he would beat me in, in less than five minutes every time. Um, he was like phenomenal at chess. I remember asking him like, "How how do you think that far ahead?" I'm like, "I can't even think two steps ahead," and you're st- thinking literally like twenty steps ahead. How do you do it? And he's just like, his response was, "I've done it. I've played the game so many times. I know every way it can go." Well, the, the <laughs> <laughs> that's basically what it was like. I can't really think that far ahead. I've just seen this before. You just um, I don't I don't know if he he was actually doing that. I mean, we all think. Uh, yeah. A lot of times when we're successful, we have an explanation for it. And mm-hmm. that explanation is an approximation filtered through what we know and our, our level of understanding of like how we, we learn a thing or how a thing works. So, sure, he thinks he is looking ahead. But the reality is, I mean, it's just there's probably common mistakes or patterns or whatever. But But chess is like... It's not the best analogy for life. I, I think poker or prize fighting is probably the best analogy for life. But chess is a pretty good analogy for life or certain parts of it because you, you're you not necessarily able to see into the future. But what you can do is take uh, a survey of the current landscape and go, OK, I'm weak here. I'm strong there. This is a little behind. I need to get mm. caught up there. He's got space over there. So let me. Let me develop over here and kind of stay away from those problem areas. And then you just make the correct move mm. over time, mm. over time. And eventually you get into a winning position. Now, now these are critical moments. They don't make themselves obvious, right? I mean, sometimes they do. But most times it's not going to be an outright, ooh, there's a checkmate. It's like, no, it's like you now you have a chance to turn a possible even position into something where you have an advantage. And then from there, you can, you know, if, if you continue to play well, you crush the game. Yeah. Magnus Carlsen, the current world champion, says, my goal every time is to play 30 good moves. That's it. Really? 30 good moves. Because it's, there's that that idea, again, of not seeing ahead. No, no I'm sure, like, he's right. got yeah. tons of patterns in his mind. He mm-hmm. kind of knows where some things go, some things won't. But that sums up this thinking, and it's a really great analogy. It's not that I'm looking – Six years ahead, I used to say when I went back to school when I was when I was twenty eight, I used to say, uh, five years are gonna pass anyway, right? Am I gonna am I gonna get am I gonna turn thirty three with more options or less options? I didn't know exactly what the options were. Someone asked me yesterday at the conference, they were like, you know, did you know uh that you were gonna be standing on this stage uh speaking to us? I'm like, No, I had no idea. In fact, if you if you wanna know exactly what I was thinking, I said, Okay, 
Uh, when I was doing that, I said the average salary for someone with physics is like 60 degree, 60,000, but the, the, the variance was incredible because there's so many things you can do with a physics degree. And I said, I'm going to get something interesting and I'll be doing like 80 K and it's going to be a great job and I have a great life mm-hmm. because I can finally eat whenever I want to. That, that's <laughs> always been my goal. It's like, I just want to be able to not look at the price of the menu. Like, right. like not even balling either. Not like, not like a Ruth Chris steakhouse, man. Like I just wanted to go out and get some Chinese food. Not yeah. think about, yeah. not think about whether my car was going to be declined <laughs> or something like that. Right. That was just the initial goal. So I made the right move when I looked at all the things that were holding me back. And I said, okay, well, I got pretty good discipline, pretty good communicating. I can, I can work hard too. I mean, I will make sure I learn something, but I just keep, losing time with the bottle man i just keep losing time being drunk all the time and hungover so let me do something about that and i I said said, okay you know we're gonna be sober we're gonna do it out try it out uh i gave myself every every possible advantage i could i went to an aa meeting i told my friends i said look man texted all my friends i said look i love you guys but i'm scared and i'm worried that i'm not gonna be able to make anything in my life or maybe i hurt somebody if i keep drinking and I, I mean, and when I say, I, I mean, uh, I, I, may, I may be understating how bad it was, right? Right. Uh, but but no, they, it was bad enough to where I was worried, and I, I you know, I, I gave myself every single. I, I immersed myself completely. If if it wasn't school, it was the army. If it wasn't the army, it was the gym. And if it wasn't that, me and my girl was doing something. I was playing with my cats. wouldn't I wouldn't let anything uh, derail me. I was recognizing that one little weakness, right? And then from there. I'm able to make things happen. I'm able to do work, but it, but and and it's important because I didn't I didn't know I was going to write a book about sobriety, for example. I had zero idea, but that book has opened up opportunities for me. And, and how did it get started? Well, I had to be sober first, right? right, right, right. And then I had to have a platform where people even cared. Yeah, I thought and, it was interesting. One of your talks, I was listening to like like people ask me who I am. I'm I'm just a sober guy. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, and and these things they just they keep coming together. I, I can build the platform because I'm not out being drunk all the time, and people care about the platform because I've done other things in my life. And why can't I do those other things in my life? Because oh, I'm not out being drunk all the time. It all mm. comes back to just making that 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 correct move and, and looking forward. You know, when when I lost the fight, we were talking hmm. about before the. Uh, before we started, when I lost the fight, I lost all. Scoot a little bit, a little bit closer. I lost all the the money, all the money. You know, and it wasn't a lot of it, but I was dependent on it. And I entered a, a dilemma. The dilemma was, well, okay, I want to finish school because I wasn't done. I took took time off when that happened. And I entered. I'm like, I need to go back to school, but I need to make enough money to pay my rent, and I need enough time to go to school. So mm-hmm. I can't work full time and get a full time salary, but part time is not going to pay me anything. Tried internships. No one would give me anything despite all the credentials and the military advantage, whatever. But here I am now. What's interesting. That, so the, so I'm, I grind, I was grinding for the past two and a half years. And in that grind, I got closer to my coach and his family. And I also had my physics and math background. And so my coach's wife says, he can if he can tutor math and physics, we might have something for him at the univer at the at the high school she was a guidance counselor at. And I said, Well, that's all I can tutor, man. I don't know anything else right at this point. And so at that point I'm able to take on clients at thirty five, then forty, then forty five, then fifty. I I had to start raising my price because right. no one else could do it. It's the only way to Norm- scale it, yeah. Normally there are Lots of tutors for lots of things, right? But the people who can do the math and the physics, you know, most of them have jobs. So there's this, mm. this weird kind of opening gap, and it's the hardest subject for kids to pick up. Mm. So they, so everyone needs help, and and then they're in the right environment to be able to afford the prices that right. you know keep me eating and living. But how did that start? I had an out. Now you can get yourself into a bad situation, mm-hmm. but if you've been taking the correct steps before, it's easier to survive. If I had just imagine if I had just been boxing, doing nothing else with my life, just partying, being a fool after every fight, and then I lose anyway. Now I ain't got that many options to recover, 
to go forward. Then I just go back to doing whatever. Maybe it was actually, actually, <laughs> I actually took a job, right? Because, because all I knew was a job, right? Yeah. This whole like working for myself thing, that experience of losing that fight. That was my baptism by fire. Like I had to learn how to make money. Like because because prior to that experience, I was just used to people giving me money for my time slash service. I right. didn't understand the concept of value generation right. and value acquisition and right. exchange. I took a job before I started tutoring where I was delivering packages for Amazon. And every time I'm in a nice neighborhood, because that's what it was. We 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 go to the facility, they load up the truck. Uh, we had to be at the facility by 5 a.m. And then we they they didn't want us on the road after sundown. And I used to think that was because they cared about us. And now I know it's just because they didn't want a lawsuit. And, I, and I'll get to and I'll get to why I know that <laughs> just a moment. But but I, I do this and I, they give me a route. They said, this is the part of the city you're in. Go for it. And it was always a really nice neighborhood. And now every time I drive through a nice neighborhood, I don't think I want to live there. I don't think, oh, this is an ambition. Like this is a driving force. I think I get cold man, because, because I lost a fight in September. Oh, and then the money ran out and then I, I got the job in December because, because it was the holidays. Everyone, they, they always look man. anyone listening. If you need a quick hustle and you're in the city, Amazon is always looking for people uh-huh. and, uh-huh. like, like, and you, there's tons of shifts because people are buying more and they're sending more stuff. They need more bodies. Right. And I was one of those bodies and I did that and I got, I mean, I just think cold. I'm like, ooh. And I go, man, I'm so happy that I'm not there anymore. But how do I know <laughs> that they just want to avoid a lawsuit and that that uh, limitation on the hours to work? How do I know that's not a uh, an altruistic thing? So I, I was delivering packages one day. This was my last day, by the way. I was delivering packages one day, and I get out. And the car, there was a malfunction and the transmission gives and it rolls down the hill. Thank goodness it was like 630 in the morning and no one was outside. And it actually rolled into someone's garage, like the in the outer part of the garage. So everyone was all good. Yeah. And what did they do? They sent a um, they sent another driver out. I was like, oh, man, they're going to rescue me. They were like, all right. Get your packages and load them into this truck. We got to finish this route. And I'm like, hold up. Y'all don't want to know if I was drinking? Like, no, Nothing. because that's what's supposed to happen on yeah, any type of accident right. involving ve- vehicles and job. They're supposed to, you know, make sure you're not drinking and, and talk to you like right there. No, nah, we right on the road. We start delivering stuff. And then we finish it. And this is when I was like, okay, this is unacceptable. I, I got to do something else. Uh, I had to just listen to this woman all day. Just <laughs> you ever, you ever know, you know those people that just everything is like I wish they would, and then they do it, and nothing happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was that kind of thing. It was like hey, you know it, they complained about the row. She's talking about she's gonna quit this that the other, and, and I, I got a feeling about halfway through I was like this is every day. So they gave me the day off. Okay, the next day. So the, and then they said, all right, you're gonna come in. That day. I was like, you know what? This is it for me, man. It, it was only like eleven dollars an hour. I said, I'll, right. I'll, I said oh at that point, I'm like, I'll figure this out. I don't know how I'm gonna figure it out, but at at that point, I knew I had to. So that's how you kind of get. Was this in Pittsburgh? This was in Pittsburgh. <laughs> wow. And then you know it, it. My life always flashes before my eyes when I think about it because I think, what if I had been like right behind that van, or what if there were, had been some people out. Or something like that, and right. I just go. You know what? I'm not going to ignore it. Like, like I'm a, I'm a big, not a big believer. I guess I have a moderate level of belief in the idea that there are signs from the universe, mm-hmm. and maybe those signs aren't uh, forward acting. It's not like you're someone saying do this, do this, and there's a no. It's like okay, here is what happened. You got a choice now, and if you make the right choice, this ain't going to happen again. <laughs> If you make the wrong choice, not only is this probably going to happen again, but it's probably going to happen worse or at least exact a, a, a steeper toll from you mm-hmm. if you don't uh, do it. Because what do they say? You know, if you if, if you don't learn a lesson, you're just going to keep getting the test over and over again until you learn the lesson. Right. And, 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 if you, and as long as you don't learn it, you can't graduate to the next level. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I learned the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the analogy you made on that one talk that you did about the mountain climber. Mm-hmm. 
don't be the don't worry about being don't be the mountain you want to be the mountain climber oh yeah that, that really uh that really inspired me i liked that one yeah. can you explain it can you explain that one? Oh, for sure you, you know i think a lot of times people let things just happen to yeah. them as opposed to making things happen it's the whole are you a subject or you're an object or my favorite way to put it if you ever seen uh, the departed at the beginning when Jack Nicholas is like, everyone says, you know, you're going to be, you're a product of your environment, but I want my environment to be a product of me. And that, I mean, first of all, I love that movie in general, yeah, yeah. But, but that is one of those things that just really sticks, sticks for you, you yeah. that idea that you're not, you're not a passive kind of participant or, or just a passive like thing in life. You're an active participant. And that was the whole idea behind the mountain versus the mountain climber. The mountain is passive. People climb the mountain. The mountain is, you know, it is what it is, man. It, wherever, the, wherever the mountain is, he's, he's stuck, too. But the mountain climber can move. He can go up. But, when, but what's the trade-off? Is that when you climb a mountain, that's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of risk involved. You can fall. You can get lost. People die climbing mountains all the time. <laughs> uh, but... But when you get to the top, you you've done a thing that that a lot of people won't ever do. They won't even try it. Many of them they're terrified, and the ones who do try, they they fail for many reasons. Many of which, not all, but many of which are due to their own decisions. You know, sometimes you get unlucky. You put your foot in a cobra hole, and that's it, right? It ain't always that way, but sometimes right. I'm like, there you go, right? Right. But but barring the things that you can't control, you know, when you maximize control over the things you have the ability to affect, and you get to the top of the mountain, you've done a really powerful thing for yourself and for how you see the world. Mm -hmm. And I think if people do more things that are difficult or challenging, they they push themselves through it. You know, you was there a time? Was there a, a time where you felt you were at the the peak? You were at the su summit of a mountain, and you had like you were oh. like really riding high. Oh yeah, you know, and then and <laughs> and was then, that was that with boxing or it was with with, with boxing, yeah. with making money online. Those yeah. are the, those are the two big examples recently. Yeah, uh, and well, and with well, boxing, you know, you, you get humbled and you get humbled hard too yeah. you know you don't you don't just kind of get humbled right mm. everyone you know those those that negative feedback loop pushes you down quick and and it pushed me you know, i went from being a guy who was like a social media person on there for all of my boxing and talking about stuff to a dude delivering packages with amazon like yeah. that is i mean you want to talk about humiliating and, and yeah. then before that right before delivering the packages, i was actually working in the warehouse right right so i'm just kind of like laying low hoping no one recognizes me well they'll talk about the losers of grandeur right hope no one <laughs> no no one recognizes me right yeah uh, no one cares you know everyone's there for their own things not yeah. like anyone but but that is a great example of getting dragged and be think you're doing well and you get knocked down. Well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna get back up. You gotta figure out a way to survive. You're just gonna you're just gonna take that, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of people in that situation, and I've seen it. They take that. I was like, this is not good, and I, I got to get out of here. Same with you know. I, I think in my my when I was in school, uh, I was doing really well. I was doing so well, and I was so close that I said, I'm gonna take four higher level classes at once is the last four classes I need to graduate. It was, what was it? It was mechanics, electromagnetism, solid state physics, and thermodynamics. I took all of them at the same time. <laughs> and, and I just, I, it was killing me. And I said, okay, but I'm going to figure this out. Right. Because, because no one ever admits to themselves how bad it is until they, they can't. And then some people deny it. Other people go, Ooh, got to do something. Well, the reports came out and they were like, yo, you, you're failing all your classes. Right. Teach the call. Like professors that have been following me and talking to me, call me and was like, is anything okay? Is everything okay? Whatever. Yeah. And finally, I, you know, I had to look in the mirror and go, you know what? I can't do this. Uh, let me stop. And I went and told my advisor and she's like, you know, when you told me you wanted to do this, I didn't think you were going to be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. I was like, so why'd you let me do it? She goes, well, 
I try to be supportive and encouraging. And and now you know, and, and plus now we got some feedback on how another how, how it can work and all that. Yeah. But I got dragged and I finished it. I mean, talking about hustle and, and, and really busting my ass, but I, I got in there mm. and I, I finished the two classes I kept with a C and I was like, wow, that's really, that, that drags you. Cause now, you know, I have those C's and I have no desire to go to grad school, but like, I, I go, okay, humbled and dragged, humbled and dragged. You make a lot of money. And then your next sell, no one buys anything. You think you know, that's happened? I mean, I remember. I remember the first time I made five figures in a month, and I said, "Ooh, I'm the man!" Right? Let me just do this again, the same way. And I try, and I barely crack four. And then you're like, "You feel yeah. sick?" You wonder what happened. You wonder what did. And then and I started asking, "Did I get lucky, or am I just bad?" And you start questioning yourself and. But on a lot of guys, they don't maybe move forward. They don't, and I, I they don't seek outside help. I think yeah. that's like the biggest issue there too, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like back to the mountain climber analogy. If you're climbing the mountain, and you and your gear is busted, there's a hole in your parka, man. You about to die. You out of food, and another guy comes by looking all shiny and clean, and he's like, "Hey, man, do you need some help?" If your prod says, no, nah, I'm good. Meanwhile, you like bleeding out of your ass. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. Uh, you know, whatever. He The help was offered and you passed and now suffer. But if you go, dude, I am in bad shape. Help me. All right. And uh, I try to do that whenever I can now because yeah. the more the more times you, you ride high and get knocked down and it happens, no matter what. Like, Because I'm, I'm sure something great is going to happen again. I'm going to feel like I'm king of the world. I'm gonna get knocked down. Yeah. You know what the difference between now though when it happens as as an adult with some experience with this cycle versus being a, a teenager or not even teenager, just a younger adult, is that now I don't boast, brag, whatever. I right. just kinda go, ooh, looking kinda nice today. <laughs> mm. Let's hope this continues. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and go Carry away. On. But like, like, you know, one of the things I, I did, you know, when I fought on TV, I went and told everybody and then I just kept telling them over text, over social media, whatever. And then you, you lose in front of the whole world in a really embarrassing fashion. And that flips the script entirely. Because, look, if you hadn't done that, if I hadn't told everyone, realistically, no, most people wouldn't have known, right? Right. <laughs> like, no, I, mean, I would love to think everyone, you know, is tuning in, but realistically, most people wouldn't know. So I brought all that pressure on. And now it's like, oh, I got to I gotta deal with that. I got to deal with how I feel about it. You know, fortunately, I, you know, I, I wrote in an article, you know, eight things I learned uh, losing on, on TV. And one of the things I said was that heaven and hell are like analogous to what happens when life is going good and life is going poorly. And when life is going poorly, you get the type of attention and energy you put out into the universe when things were going well. And if you want to be, yeah, if you want to take that even less abstract, mm-hmm. how you treat people when you don't have to treat them well is how they're going to treat you when you are right. not doing well. And so, and because I'm a big guy on like support, positivity, giving back, very grateful for everything in my life. You know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a bunch of people, you know, killing me. If you watch the social media comments after some of these guys who lose when they, when they're real a holes, oh man, it, it it shows you people, people may act nice, but the reality is, if you cross, you don't even have to cross somebody. If, if if they just if they don't like you and you give them reasons to dislike you, yeah. they are gonna they just they're licking their chops yeah. for when things go wrong. Oh yeah, when they go wrong, they are gonna remind you and they are gonna and you'll never be able to forget. Especially on social media too. You know, and and <laughs> I'm I don't I don't bring out the haters at least not nearly as bad as anyone else on social media. I think in terms of like controversial personalities, I'm relatively tame. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, I, I I remember when I when I when I when I lost, no one on Twitter really bugged me. Not that much. Every now and then, someone go, "Oh man, your head must still be ringing from that." When you say <laughs> when you lost, did you only lose one time? I only lost one time as a pro. Really? Mm-hmm. But, I want to hear that story. But professional boxing is is 
<laughs> yeah, oh, there's so much, so much to it. I'll, I'll jump right you, into you, it. You, so you lost like one televised match. Yes. Okay. Because you know that unless you, so, so everything is like, what have you done? And why should we give you this thing? Right. right. If you've done well, we give you more things and we continue to see if you're worth it. And then eventually you get to a point where they're like, okay, mm -hmm. well, we've invested in you. We're going to take our pound of flesh back. Right. And that's what a good contract does. A good contract should have the fighter. <laughs> I hate to say it like this, but this is what it is. A good contract usually puts the fighter in, in a bit of an indentured servitude position. Right. Right. You're the difference being now that. Uh, the fighter can walk. Now, when the fighter walks on a contract, he can't fight for like not. Now, I've seen it nine to 12 months, though. They won't even let you fight anyow. Really? But, oh, yeah. Afterwards? It, it, if you walk on a contract, yeah. Okay. Now, if, if your your terms are up or it's like a mutual release, you know, but but they a lot of times that's just put in there. If you, if you act like a if you, if you act like a bad person, I don't know how how R rated my speech can get. But I'm just going to yeah. keep it. Keep it nice and PG-13. Uh if you act like a really bad person, that's just a way for people to kind of protect their investment and or okay. make your life annoying. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, so, so I get the contract, a professional contract when I was and I, and I have to well, we're going to break some boxing game down. Right. I don't know how much you know about boxing, but everyone's going to get a nice little. OK, uh, I know. A lesson fair, I know about a fair the, share. Nice little lesson about the business end of things. OK, so there are shows. And shows where fighters fight. And those shows are put on by promoters. And the fighters on those fights are managed by managers. And for a while, you used to be able to have the manager and the promoter be the same entity no longer. That's just, that's illegal. You can't do it anymore. I, okay. I don't remember what, I think it's part of the Muhammad Ali Act, but... Uh, I'm not. I'm not 100. Is sure. there a specific reason for that? Well, sure. It, it creates conflict of interest. Okay. For you know, sometimes that's okay. We're like we're like if a manager. So so what happens, right? So you have a manager and a promoter as acting as one entity, and he brings a fighter on, uh, and he manages one fighter that's going to fight another fighter, and the promoter knows. Right, because how does the promoter get paid? The promoter gets paid when it, when the tickets are sold, mm -hmm. and the manager just gets a cut of the winnings. Okay, you know? so it, it there is no reason if you have both of those guys work together, there's no person fighting to get the highest purse for the fighter because the promoter is always going to take a cut of the whole thing. Oh, okay, that makes right? sense. Right, yeah. So it it put it it removes the lever, and it's really to protect the fighter. I mean, the manager yeah, would yeah. love to be the promoter, right. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's really what it comes down to is that kind of thing. Okay. Right? So you, those are those are three big players: the promoter who puts the fights on, the manager who gets the fighter the fight a lot of times, mm -hmm. or is the the promoter now now they figured out some kind of ways to work around this, but we'll we'll get to that and the fighter. Okay. All right. So the fighter is always looking to get promoted by a big promoter, top rank, go and boy. Um, those are the two guys that come up to my right now, Dazzin or Dazon, if you're familiar with any of these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the promoters. They have these big old shows. They have all the, they're the ones that sell the tickets, put the money up, take the risk. And then the managers are like, we're trying to get you signed with a promoter because then a the promoter is like, okay, we want you on right. for like, you know, yeah. three shows and we're going to make money with you and all that. And the fighters are like, all right, well, here I am. And here's a cut of my earnings. I'm the one taking all the risk. But there you go. So the better you fight and the better your resume, whether it be through amateur accomplishments like a national title or an, or an Olympic medal or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the sooner you get signed by a promoter because everyone wants to get signed by a promoter because the promoter – now, this is changing just a little – but the promoter is the one that won their name is on it and they have all the connections like the TV dates, right? Mm. Now TVs are becoming a little obsolete because everyone's switching to apps. The the zone took a big risk and it really paid off. They have a huge um just a huge base. Nine ninety nine a month compared to a one hundred dollar one time right. pay per view. Uh, and and even if even if you only have two pay per views, that's that's you know two hundred dollars, right. as opposed to a a nine ninety nine a month thing. And people don't think like that anyway, right? Even no. they they don't break the math down and go, okay, well, it makes right. sense. no. They, all they see is this only nine ninety nine a month. Of course, I get this. Look, man, I've only watched like four of my disown like fights, <laughs> right. on, yeah. and, but but it's only nine ninety nine a month. I don't think about it. Right. It just just comes out of my my yep. account. Yep. So. 
That's what they want to get. They want to take because they the promoters done all that work to build this platform to have these guys come and fight. And the sooner you get that, that's everyone's goal because anyone can fight on a local show. That's what I did. You fight on these local shows and build up. But what's the local show limited by? Space. Mm. You can only get. I mean, what? Well, 500 people maybe into a, into a good venue until you start getting like MGM Grand and bigger places, which the big promoters pay for and they take the risk and put up where you can put, you know, 10,000, 15,000 mm. butts in the seat and you can make a lot of money. Yeah. So I didn't get, I, I just had a manager when I started and then that manager got me a deal with a promoter. And my promoter then put me on all these different shows as they're moving and developing me, somewhat acting like a, a manager, but but not really. But because they I've worked with a, a, a new promoter, uh, yeah. Rock Nation Sports, and they hadn't really they, they were putting on shows, but they were in the meantime developing the fighters they saw by letting them fight on other shows. OK, because the promoter doesn't always have to let you fight on someone else's show. He's like, I paid for you. You know, I, right. I'm, I'm trying to invest you. But they're doing that to develop on these local shows, smaller shows, bring the opponent in, pay the opponent, all that good stuff. Okay. Right? And then they have a TV date. So that's how you get on TV without a TV date, without look, without a TV date or the internet now with Daz, you, you got no chance. You, you'll be you'll be fit fighting for peanuts for your entire career because there's just no way to make more money. And it's crazy when you talk to some fighters who don't understand this. Little this what I just broke down. Who don't understand this? They complain to a local promoter. I have a buddy that's a local promoter. He tells me all the time. He goes. These guys, they want more money all the time. And I'm like, well, there's a very much a cap on how much money you can give them. Because, and, and they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. So that's how that, that goes. The manager, promoter, okay. and the fighter. Right. And so and, and so everyone's dream is to get a promoter with TV dates and a bigger reach or access to bigger venues because that's where the money is, at least in America. In, in Europe, it's a bit different. Yeah. But the, the, Euro, the in Europe, they're not competing with – the NFL, the NHL, the MLB, and the NBA, mm. the, the the big four. So so fighting is still the fighting is just received better. There's just there's more money. There are more people who watch it. Yeah, it's it's on more networks. Way more. There. And also, this is really awesome too. The United States people go, oh man, why why are we sucking boxing in the Olympics all of a sudden? Well. We're competing against countries where one, the best athletes aren't being taken to the gridiron or the basketball court, for example, and they also pay for the coaching. the The fighting systems are the, the fighting system. Mm. Uh, the sports are subsidized by the government. So, uh, you know, the, the story uh, about Gennady Golovkin. He is a great fighter out of his his country uh, I think Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan well, it's one or the other so okay. you know people who watch <laughs> they don't know, like yeah. it's wrong and great fighter does all these things I think he won a medal I'm not sure but he he wants to go pro and he wants to fight in America and so he and normally when that happens in America a fighter stays with the same coach from amateur to professional because that makes sense. He put that time and that investment. Right. He he trained the kid when the kid quite was not even capable of earning. Right. He wants to stay, and now he earns, and now he gets a cut. Well, not so much in these places where the, the where the, the the coach is paid. Hmm. So he's like, ah, I, well, I'm not, I'm not leaving. I have a great thing here. Are right. You kidding? Yeah, I produced you. Right. <laughs> hmm. I'm not gonna pay me more now. Why would I leave? So he gets he's got another coach and you know I think his uh, his coach is the guy the guy named Abel Sanchez out of California really and, and like Abel didn't train him as an amateur Abel just got him when he was a pro wow and and that's why because of, and a lot of these guys when out of these other countries man they, they do well because they 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 have they take care of the fighters when they train. Mm. And that's really important because because unlike professionals, amateurs don't earn any money, right? right? right. So they got to do something to earn money. And that something, assuming it's legal, that something takes time away from, I mean, even if it's illegal, right? right? Uh, right. Takes time away from training. Right. But they don't have that issue in, in other countries. So it's mm -hmm. a, they're just walking into a very competitive situation. Wow. 
I did, I did. I had no idea that the sport was subsidized in, in countries like that. Mm -hmm. if, if you look, I mean, I, I think what the, the, the United States. Ooh, we don't do that with any sports here, do we? No. Uh, well, okay. Well, 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 do we? Uh, for for <laughs> Olympic level sports, no. But look right. at look at the way we do our football and our baseball. It, we, we don't call it subsidizing the sport. What we do is we call it a scholarship. Okay. Right for college school. And yeah, and 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 you know now the NCAA is, is, has yeah. ruled, and that yeah. dude, I can't. Oh, in California, wait. right now, now they can Florida, pay college. Oh my god! And now oh, really? Florida is proposing the same legislation, really, which is a big deal because that's huge. When California did it, the NCAA was like, "Okay, you're big, California, but we're not going to allow you to participate if you do this," and they did it. So now that's what they were doing. If Florida comes on board, now they have a hard decision because those are two really big, big I mean, a lot of powerhouse schools yeah. in both places. And then after that, it's only a matter of time. I'm, Texas is probably going to follow suit. In oh, the end. for sure. And then the NCAA is going to be forced to make a very big choice, but they won't need. What are you going to do? You're going to block out the, the big buyers or the big, the big schools. And they're doing it in such a way that the, the coaches don't have to feel threatened because they're, they're not saying – you're going to pay the students. What they're saying is they can make money off of their likeness. Right. And that's a really big deal. Oh, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, so the, so the colleges aren't paying them. They're not going to pay them. What they're going to know they make so much advertising money off them. It's <laughs> ridiculous. Crazy. Crazy. So, so, so this is, this is nuts, right? As, as an athlete, well, and we're going to use football. So when I say this, anyone listening, right. I'm talking about NCAA football. I don't know how it works for anyone else, uh, but and, but I know that football brings in the most money. So this is it, the most uh, football and basketball uh, most relevant. If you're a big time player, you're not allowed to work and you're not allowed to take money. Right. So how are you supposed to get money? What well, school is supposed to cover you? Okay. And that, that's kind of cool. But look at how much money the schools make off of a player that gets big time. Oh, even it's a, insane. Even a player gets small time. I, I spoke at the University of uh, South Carolina this year. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they were telling me, because I just took a tour to the school. I spoke to the football team and I took a tour to the facilities and everything. He was saying that, like, these guys are like rock stars because of the internet. Hmm. Kid guys have three posts oh, and yeah. 50,000 followers. Yeah. Because everyone just goes, because they just go and look at the website yeah. and see the roster and load them up, and then. But we're all saying the other big issue is everything. Everything comes with a with a price, right? Mm -hmm. The other big issue is that these guys they can't because they're they're teenagers. They don't have the discipline to be right. like, I'm going to ignore those comments. It's already hard enough for adults. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh some guys <laughs> right. in the NBA still can't even hold back on it. Right, and so you expect an 18, 19 year old kid with right. all this attention to. Yeah. So ignore that. But yeah, so that's the big deal now. And that's what annoys me about football fans in general. They're, they'll always complain. Like I'm like me, mainly the old white guys. They'll be like, oh, these fucking guys can't keep their mouth shut. They just fucking spat. These guys are millionaires, but they're idiots. We're like, dude, this guy's 20 years right. old. And people forget that. Because, right. Because we <laughs> correlate uh, a lot of a thing with time and experience. Right. And they right. have the experience. Right. Absolutely. And right. they have the time invested in such a small amount of space yeah i mean most people are never going to get to the point in their career where they're capable of earning seven figures right in a single calendar year yeah but if you can do that as an athlete yeah of, of course people right. people are gonna look and they're gonna well well, why can't you? Why can't right. you stop smoking weed? Right, right, <laughs> right. right. yeah. Like that was a big deal with the Steelers, right? <laughs> yeah. they, they they called them in the city. Well, Le'Veon Bell sticky at sticky the airport, Le yeah. <laughs> and Stay off Blunt. the weed, right. Stephen A. Smith. <laughs> and, and so it's funny on the one end, like you're like, okay, dude, clearly you're a, you're an a hole. You can't stop smoking weed. <laughs> on the other end, you got to remember you're talking to a 22 year old. Exactly, he just happens to be famous and rich. right. You know, no one gives. Think of it this way: think about rock stars. Same thing. Oh the yeah. The difference is they're rock stars. Right. So they're, they're allowed. They're, they're allowed to, to do <laughs> cocaine and smoke weed and smoke crack, whatever they when want. When I was to do. when I was at the height of my training, I said, "In the next life, I'm going to be a rock star. I'm, I'm not going to be. <laughs> I'm going to be Rick James. I, I'm right. I'm, I'm not going to be an athlete because being an athlete is like being an athlete is like uh, Adam and Eve and Apple." Mm hmm. You get this nice garden, you get all this stuff, and there's that apple, and that apple is 
drinking. Yeah. Heavy. <laughs> staying out all night, partying with fans. Yep. People who want to buy you stuff. Girls who don't even care to if if you learn their name. <laughs> yeah. And God, the, the person who gives you your athletic ability and all this talent. Yep. He goes, you can have anything in the garden. <laughs> just don't eat the apple. <laughs> That's all you got to do. And you can stay. And what do you do? What's the first thing? <laughs> you want that apple. Oh, my God. <laughs> there's carrots. There's pears. He, you could kill the animals if you figure out fire. <laughs> and you eat that apple. You know, he's like, hey, man, that's it. You got to go. And then, so there, it, it's I'm really looking forward to how that changes the, mm, the yeah. athletic landscape. In oh, this for country sure. Because at the end of the day, and here's the other thing, too. When people argue back and they go, well, we're giving them scholarships. We're giving them scholarships. Of course, that's great. And I'm like, have you been to a have you seen what these guys major in? Yeah, yeah right. like they're not. <laughs> Yeah, no. It's, I'm, like, I'm it's actually so, laughing. It's, thinking I don't about know it. why they don't. That's, right, they're not taking the education serious. Not right. Not only are they not majoring or anything useful, what they are studying, they're not taking it seriously. And on top of that, the school is more interested in the in the money. You exactly. Money. So, so what are right. they going to do? They're not going to flunk them out class. Right. They're, no one. When's the last time you heard of somebody Never. getting on <laughs> academic probation? Well, like, and he didn't a play star on Sunday or on something. Academic probation. Yeah. Right. Right. That right. Happen. No. Now, now, if you can't do anything, you just taking up space. Yeah, right. put you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how it is, man. And the That's other thing is, like, when I was that age, like, I can't remember how much of a dumbass I was when I was that age. When I was oh. that young, like in my late teens, early twenties, and then imagine just having that massive microscope on you of ev- oh millions of people watching you every moment, sp- scoping in on everything you post on social media, all the comments, and then on top of that, give some young, you know, ignorant cocky kid millions of dollars that's gonna fuck them up even worse that, mentally you know what gonna, i mean it's, it's gonna ruin them yeah I, check this out i learned i'm i'm I, th- I would like to think at this point in my life i am i'm above average at managing money and i yeah. say above average because now my money does not just I, I, i'm pat i'm way past blowing it <laughs> uh but it doesn't just sit in my bank account either i like right put it in a place where it can do a thing for me right right i'm not like up to investing in stocks yeah but, but i try you. to use my money and let it go do what do you do you got real estate oh uh, no I, uh, well so i guess it technically it's like i have acorn right acorn takes 25 out of my account <laughs> yeah. and puts it someplace and i checked it it'd been doing it for a year i was like wow i think i made like 40 bucks off it is it's not a lot yeah but but it beat inflation so, yeah so it was kind of cool right that is cool so, so so I'm a, I'm above average. Hell yeah. When I was 18, my dad died. When he died, his life insurance gave me $55,000. What? I didn't even and it gave me, not my mom to hold for me, it gave me cuz I was an adult at 18. In 18 months, I was overdrawing the account and sleeping <laughs> oh, on my aunt's no. floor. <laughs> and and dude, when I look at like what I have to show for it It's not like I had a I mean I, I bought myself a chain And some stupid clothes A lot of fast food I didn't even drink that. I mean No I mean I Because well, I was in college I was drinking other people's alcohol mm-hmm. Yeah I look at I was buying fast food Man the Chinese food place I, they, they knew me by first name <laughs> Domino's All that good stuff Spending I had no concept of like What made sense to buy What did not make sense to buy Where to put money yeah. And so that's that's me from the type of environment that a lot of right. these guys are from. Yep. And I got all I got all relative to like an NFL contract was 55K and I couldn't even hold on to it for 12 for, for, for 18 damn. months. I mean, that, that, that's what I God <laughs> it, damn. It's fun, look, it's funny in retrospect. What a lesson. That was expensive lesson in money Ooh. management. Damn. Mm-hmm. In retrospect, hilarious. Like, oh, man, look at look at 18-year-old me. I can't figure it out. Yeah. Meanwhile, I, I remember uh, when I was 19, I was I was uh, living on my aunt's floor, sleeping on it, because she already had a bunch of people living with her. I wasn't going back home uh, at all, not not because of shame or anything. I Whose floor did you say you were living with? Aunt? My aunt's. Your aunt. Okay. My aunt's floor. You yeah. weren't. 
Getting along with your mom or what? Oh, no, no. We weren't. I mean, that's another story in okay. itself why we weren't getting along. And we, okay. we can touch on that, too, because that's probably uh, some, some very powerful lessons about forgiveness in there. Yeah. But when I'm doing that and I need to eat during the day, during the evening, I would just go over to this girl's house. I was dating. I, ma- I mastered the art of uh, being a hobo sexual. <laughs> of, of, of That's what he is. He's a hobo sexual. <laughs> you, you get your girlfriend or, or your girlfriend's parents to feed you. You can be all right if you get if you run that yeah. game. <laughs> but I'm asking. But during the day, I had to eat something. I had, I had a, a list of CVSs and Right Aids. I would go in and I figured out how to slide some Pringles. I used to, that's what I used to take. I used to steal Pringles uh-huh. and some. Uh, I think it was like Fago Pop, right? And I would put that in my. In my in my uh, pocket, and that's what I would eat during that day. Damn, and and I was really good. At, I knew the camera angles, everything, man. And yeah, you, know, you got to survive. It, look, it was either that or not eat. Right now, 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 now that I'm like, what's funny? Now I'm I'm real big into intermittent fasting. <laughs> <laughs> you could have just fasted the whole could've time. Could have just fasted before, you know. I, I remember one day my friend of mine was like, "Yo, is that homeless?" Because I because I was like. Wearing the same thing yeah. for days, and the facial hair I yeah. had at nineteen was probably really? man, I look looked rough. But lessons you learn, yeah, hard real. lessons, fun yeah. lessons. A thing I will never do again. Not only will I never do it again, but I'll never have a relationship with my children. You know, when I have them, where yeah. where they don't think they can come home and they don't feel yeah. comfortable because that's, that's just a rough time. My mom, you know, I wrote about this uh, to my email list. Mm-hmm. I just told them that story, and she was like. I don't know why you wouldn't come home. And I'm like, yes, you do. And, and, mm. and it's crazy. I had, I had a lot of issues um, with my mom. Some of them was just, you know, my, my personality and, and why it happened, but, and, or, and how it happened, you know, you clash with another personality, but a lot of it is, uh, so, so my mom was not mature at all. Emotionally, Mentally, I think. I mean, physically, she was an adult and had me. So, by definition, right, mature there. But I'll never forget when I was eleven. And the eleven years old is when I realized that I was going to have to take care of myself because she gets drunk and gets into a fight with this woman in the street. And I remember uh, standing between her and the door, saying, "Don't go outside. Like, just just stay in here." And she yeah. doesn't listen and goes and gets arrested and we have to deal with that and at that point i was like she'd have getting arrested yeah she yeah, beat yeah. the lady's ass or what oh yeah and then and then, <laughs> and then in retaliation we woke up to all this garbage dumped on our porch it was ridiculous oh my God. and then we had to do it to, you know and then we had to do it with her kids you know trying to fight us it was, it was stupid oh my man God. but like i remember going this is the i was i was even at 11 i had enough wherewithal to understand what the dynamic between a parent and a child should be and I said, you, you and your lack of discipline, you, you abandoned us. I, and that's what I felt. And then that, that was the, the tipping, not the tipping point, but that was really the start of it. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize how badly, uh, how poorly behind, how far behind I was until I got to high school. And I had the really fortune, I had the, the fortune of just, we, we living in something called a magnet system. I don't know if they have something like that here, but if you apply and you meet the criteria, you can go to any high school that is not your region's high school that will feed you in within the city. And I, and I had enough sense to know I cannot continue to go to school in this area because hmm. I'll either end up becoming a kingpin or a killer, but no situation is going to turn out well for me if I continue going here. Mm-hmm. So I got to go to this other school. And <laughs> and for the first time, it was the first time I'd ever been in a, in a home where like a, a a husband and wife lived and raised kids and they, they had a house and it was out the projects. I mean, I was like, I was floored. And what happened is that over time, watching how my mom continued to behave and the options that I was given or I felt like I didn't get, and it's true, I didn't get a lot of options and not, nothing. I mean, literally nothing. Yeah. Uh, I think about uh, that, I, that I was exposed to. I mean, we always had like food for the, mo- for the most part, right? But yeah. But never uh, the the ability to explore anything besides, you know, go to school, come back, go to school, come back. I was like, this is messed up. And I just got angrier and angrier. And, and then I thought about a lot of other stuff, too. 
and that I where I felt like the ball was was dropped. You know, some people that we were we were around growing up, like one of the articles I was talking to you about, like being raised by crackheads. That that really. Well, you know, she wasn't a crackhead, but, but we were babysat by crackheads and around them and you everything. You said you mentioned to me that you knew it crack smoke smelt like and you were like sick of it or something. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, 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 you see these things and you don't think anything of them until you see how it could and should be. Right. Because when I was there, I was just like, OK, everybody's messed up. Mm-hmm. Whatever. Right. right. Everyone. You have to fight all the time. Right. And I felt like because like, and I and then I had a friend where I got to see like what his mom did, you know, getting out. And, and working hard and and it just it it made me so angry one day to think about a lot of the abuse that I ended up suffering and dealing with and so I said there's no way I'm going to go back I I'm not going to get along there we have a very different way of seeing things I I have a very big I'm I'm really good about dealing with the future or at least better and continue to try and get better and she isn't very much instant gratification very much I'm very emotional uh so I left and I, I spent time being very angry. And then one day I figured out and it was it was affecting how I would deal with her when I saw her. So you went like on your own, you moved away. and Oh, like, yeah. You know, okay. since since I was 18, I've, I've moved. I moved home one time and I because I needed to go home. And I just I, I had it was a rock bottom point that like we talked okay. about. Yeah. And it, and it only lasted four months because right around month three, I was or maybe month two. I was like, this is a problem. <laughs> I, I, I will. Su- I will suffer out there. I like, I'm going to suffer no matter what, basically, is what I thought. And I mm-hmm. said, well, let's suffer in a way to hopefully build some character and doesn't have me think about doing something crazy. Mm. But I got tired of being angry. I got tired of being angry. Uh, and it wasn't consistent with the way my kind of philosophy about the world was developing, which is very much the responsibility for how you feel and your environment and how you think about things. So I, I was like, I started to dive into forgiveness and mm. forgiveness. And, and now it is it is very much, if you want to talk about like my, my spiritual yeah. uh, system, yeah. it's all based on forgiveness. Okay. It, it, the the book, the, A Course in Miracles, whenever people ask me like, oh, what books should, should I read? What's your book recommendation? Yeah. I have three books. Uh, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do by Bruce Lee for your body. The Art of Learning for your mind. And A Course in Miracles for your heart. Course in Miracles, the mm-hmm. Course in Miracles, and it may. I mean, it, the whole premise. I won't get into the whole premise. It's kind of kooky, but the basic idea is that forgiveness is the only way you can ever be at peace, right? And you just, but you, but forgiveness is is an act. It's not a thing. You just well, I'm going to be forgiven. Nope, no, you have to work at it, and there's a way to work at it, and it really much, uh, very much influenced how I was able to work through a lot of problems. How like now when I look back at some of my behavior when I was drinking, how that affected things. Hmm. And because because when you stop drinking and you look back at yourself when you're sober, you go, holy <clears throat> hell, that guy was a problem. And you just, and you feel bad. You feel bad about the way you talked, the way you treated some of the things you did, the risk you took, mm-hmm. the lives you put in danger, the people you annoyed, the friendships you strained, all of that. You feel bad about all of it. And I don't have those moments that much anymore. But when I first stopped drinking, I would have a lot of them. Okay, but I dealt with them by forgiveness. I had to learn to forgive myself. I, th- I always say you got to forgive three things to be at peace. You got to forgive yourself. You got to forgive the world. And you got to forgive the people who wronged you. It's it's easy to complain that the world is one way. You know, I understand what you say about people that wronged you, but mm-hmm. what do you mean about forgiving yourself? Like, what do you what do you mean by that? Okay, so. So we think, I think a lot of times we feel guilty. This this is my idea about guilt, and I may or may not have got this from the book. I like remember. guilty, right. Like I didn't go to the gym today. I feel guilty about that, or I, I, I went out and got fucked up last night. And oh, I, right. Now, now, I think that's a general state of disappointment. But when I, when I talk about guilt, I think we feel guilty about a thing that we've, when we've done something, and we think we got away with it. We think we got the benefit without mm, without paying okay. the cost. Got it. Right. We th- it's why you know they talk about like people who turn themselves in uh, mm. for crimes. They do it because I, I really think there's a part of the population and probably a significant part. It might be part of being human that we don't do well when well like we 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 know that equality is kind of an illusion and we know that there should but we do know that fairness is not. I think intuitively and internally, we know that for X, 
there should be a, some kind of minus X ish yeah. uh, response. And if you get the X, you feel you feel guilty. Mm-hmm. If you it, it, right, you want to talk about even even at the I don't think you feel guilty so much for missing the gym. As you do for not having your physique immediately go to shit, right? Not right. Have, like whenever you miss the gym and you immediately got you know you you put on ten pounds and yeah. your guts are hanging out, you, you're gonna feel you're gonna like, okay. That's what was supposed to happen. Yeah, <laughs> right. But if you if that doesn't, then you feel bad, mm. and then it keeps going, and you're like, oh man, well I know, and then eventually you either start going to the gym. Or you accept the new state of things right. because your mind can't reconcile. Now, on the flip side, you would know something's really wrong. If you were pounding it out every day in the gym, but nothing was happening. There was no yeah. muscle. And that's another issue, right? Right. But the whole guilt thing comes when we think we've done something wrong and we have not. Or, or we think we got some benefit. Without putting in the work together. Without putting in the work. Yeah. Or we acquired it. But in, a, in, in, a, in a immoral way, in a or, moral way, right. and, and I, I don't like the word immoral. I, I, something more quantitative. Uh, we acquired it in a way where the other people didn't know that they had to pay for. Right. It, okay. Which is why lying makes us feel guilty. We we got away with it. We didn't have to yeah. deal with the conflict. But now the other person kind of has to bear uh, bear the, the the weight of the bear the Somebody cost. Somebody else suffered. Right. They have to pay, and so. You forgive yourself. Like for me, well, he's a perfect example uh, in my life. I think about all the times I drove drunk. No one died, sure. But the risk was there. And I'm a really big person about risk. Maybe if I was had a more deterministic mindset and I didn't think about the probabilities, maybe it doesn't bother me. But I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of the probability. I, I mean, I, I talk about it all the time. I mean, I stopped drinking before the law of large numbers caught up with me. Which is the whole idea. The more you you commit, the more times you flip a coin, right? <laughs> yeah. The more, the closer it should get to one half, which is what we expect. You know, half the time has to tell. But if you flip it 10 times, it could be like you could realistically get 10 heads in a row, right? right? But the larger the number of trials gets, the closer you trend to what the expected average should be, mm-hmm. right? So, like blackjack. Right, <laughs> you, you can. Uh, that's why the casino always wins. That's, yeah, man. that's right. The that's, house that's, always wins. Right? That's true. Right. So that's true. If if I I, I think about this and I go, well, I, just, I beat the law of large numbers, right? That that or I stop playing before the law of large numbers beats mm-hmm. me is a better way to look at it. And that makes me feel guilty because there are, I know there there are some people. I talk to some guys. They got four DUIs, and I'm like, I know how you get four, <laughs> man. Fuck. Should I've been pulled over four times and got out of it? I you, know. you got a four? <laughs> How'd that happen? <laughs> right? But and I drink ten times more than you do. <laughs> it, exactly. All it is is it, the coin land in some way, and then when you look at it that way, you can feel bad. Mm-hmm. You know, or are you 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 steal something and no one realizes? Everyone's pointing the blame, or somebody else does it, and they right. take the cost, and you're aware of it. It's going to make you feel guilty. So how do you forgive yourself for something like that? Uh, I think the first thing you have to do is, one, it's going to be maybe not what you expected. <laughs> first thing you got to do is realize that it's in the past. I think we, we hold grudges and we have uh, difficulty forgiving when we think, well, because we think that our emotions are going to somehow change. If we get angry enough or sad enough, uh, the causality will be reversed and we can go and make it right. Yeah. Nothing not happen. Right. That's why we think if we, so why, so why we think revenge is going to balance the scale, right. but, it, but then you can get your revenge. You can go, huh? Well, that didn't undo it. And I still feel like shit. And on top of that, I feel even worse. Now that I did something to somebody and affected a bunch of other lives who had nothing to do with it. That's how it goes up. Right. Hmm. So the first step, though, is is to just understand it's in the past and there's nothing you can do about it. At the same time, you can own that you had something to do with it. And the third way is to remember, and this is the hardest thing for most people, this is the hard step that a lot of people, they follow me on the first one, they follow me on the second one, the third one is where they go, I'm not sure, man, you sound like you on crack. <laughs> the third step is you have to remember that no matter what, you did the thing and the other person did the thing uh, or, or to you or you did the thing because you were chasing what you believed was the best way to get uh, a feeling. You thought it was the best way to feel fun. The other person thought it was the best way to alleviate something. And that's how you can 
be forgiven. That's how you can forgive someone else. Because look, if, if someone, I think about the worst thing that happened to me, it's been a long time someone did something, did something foul to me. Uh, <laughs> let's say like my girlfriend cheated on me or something. Okay. The first response is to be angry. It's the whole grudge to want to do something bad. But but I have to forgive her. And remember, forgiveness, I always have to say this, forgiveness doesn't substitute justice. I still got to break up with her, right? <laughs> yeah. And if someone kills my family, look, man, I, they still got to go to jail. Uh, forgiveness is to, for, to keep me from dealing with that emotional burden and perhaps doing something destructive to myself because I think I can fix it. Right. That's what forgiveness is. So with mm. that, with that caveat out of the way, uh, I have to look at that going back to the girlfriend cheating example or, or even a family killing example. Somebody killing a family member of yours. Yeah. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a that's relevant a thing deal. in the media today. It just well, happened. But they did it because they thought that it was going to bring them closer to peace for one way or the other. And in doing so, their actions are no different than my actions. And so I can take that and emotionally wrap my mind around it. Mm. That does not excuse the action. That does not mean I'm going to be cool with them. That doesn't mean any of that. You forgive a person so you don't carry that emotional burden yourself. So you don't have to suffer. Right. That, that That's it. P- perfect. Right. Because that's the idea. No one suffers but you when you hold a grudge. Exactly. Right. What is that old saying? It's like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die or something like that. That is so spot on. And if you get that, then you can easily uh, forgive. Like that's yeah. the, But that's the hard part. That is the hardest step mm. for many people. to. to, to yeah. Hear. That's strong, man. That's really strong. I think that's important for a lot of people to understand, be able to understand that, to experience. You got to experience things like that where people really fuck you over or yeah. where you fuck somebody else over. Or, you know what I mean? Where two people can can come together and forgive each other or, you know, and, like you and said. I, and I think, like, you know, what, what you said is, is, is another part, I think, of development. It'd be nice. I think we all would like to fashion ourselves as the hero in our story. <laughs> we go through life and... The whole time, only we're, we are the only people who suffer wrong. We never do any wrong. It's not true. And owning that, I think, brings you a lot of peace because it forces you to take a process that you normally extend to other people, other things, forgiveness, and it forces you to apply it to yourself. Mm-hmm. I, I talked to a friend of mine that had dealt with some trauma, a uh, female. This is important for the story. I dealt with some trauma. And she had trouble. She could forgive the, her attacker. She had trouble, so much trouble forgiving herself. She thought, okay, if I hadn't said this or did this or been in that position, this would not have happened. If I had been stronger, if I had resisted, this would not have happened. Mm. And in her mind, she can wrap herself around the idea that a person is evil and victimized and she can forgive that. Your own hangups will determine what you can or cannot forgive where you have trouble because she can't wrap her mind around the idea that she made a mistake. Mm. She just made an error in judgment. She, she missed the bad guy. Mm. It happens. People can't, people have a hard time forgiving themselves. I think they have a way harder time forgiving themselves than they do other people. I, I really believe that a person can forgive the the killer. Let's say someone killed the kid, your yeah, kid or something. Right. This is an extreme. But I, I think that people would have a harder time forgiving themselves for allowing it to happen. And I don't even like using the verb allow, but I think that's the best word I have to it to to describe that kind of extended <clears throat> action, right? For for right. letting it happen, allowing it to happen than they would for somebody taking advantage and being and, and exacting such a cruel, cruel uh, action on them. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine something that extreme, someone killing someone really close to you and, and, and feeling that hatred towards that person nonstop every day. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's exhausting. Just, it, yeah. it demolishes you. It would. You yeah. Know? And, but it's also extremely hard to get over that wall to be able just to let go. Yeah, and and I I never say it should be easy. 
and, but, 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 but I, sometimes people don't think about it that way. They think yeah. they just do whatever's, whatever well, is instant gratification. Not only, not only that, but they can't see a reason, you know, right. pe- people, you have to take your inner peace and your wellness <laughs> so right. seriously. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's just what, what it comes down to is if, if you, if you follow it logically, you end up in the same place as you would if you follow it emotionally or, or, or rationally, I guess. If you follow it rationally, you'll end up in the same place uh, you will if you follow it emotionally, mm-hmm. which is the other person does not experience what you continue to beat yourself up for. So you have to do something about that. And the premise that I follow is what you do about that is forgiveness and forgiveness is not a substitute for justice. Justice right. still has to be done. Big believer in that. I'm the guy that's going to be swinging the ax and taking your head off, telling you, look, man, it's okay. I really don't feel anything. Hey, man, why are you cut my head off? No, 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 that's not for you. That's for me. <laughs> right. I don't feel it. I just want you to know I, I forgive you. You're forgiven. Yeah. But you're still dead. <laughs> but, but, you, but you still got to go, man. Like, <laughs> that kind of thing. And people uh, don't get that. And that's hard for people to reconcile, too, is that yeah. you can – you can exact the punishment. You can protect yourself, but but you can still forgive. I like that. So, I really like that. And I think it, I think it's a very very strong and deliberate way to live. Mm-hmm. So uh, maybe that's why people resist it because it's very deliberate. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Well, cool, man. I read on your Twitter that you have you have some links to your to some books that you've written on your Twitter, or is that, are they on your website? Or? Yeah, website and Twitter. Okay, yeah, I saw, and you got like you got like hundred thousand something followers on Twitter, dude. You're blowing up, man. Yeah, people people <laughs> keep finding me. I wonder if they're following me now because of like because they see so many other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Like, is that oh, is that what happens when you get so many that it snowballs like that? People just like, well, oh, I I, it's not so much that it snowballs. I think it, it models. I think it grows exponentially. I was gonna yeah. say models after E, but like that's just the math not nerd to me. Um, yeah, but in other words, you know. Uh, each one follower can get two people to follow, and each yeah. other people can get two. So it goes one, two, four. Uh, I think you got some big four. followers though. Yeah, yeah. yeah that that yeah. too. Uh, I noticed you have Rick Rubin following Rick, you. Yeah, you know, someone messaged me. He was like, "Yo, did you know Rick Rubin follows <laughs> yeah. you?" And I said, "No, let me look up who that." Because, because I mean, I'm not. You didn't even him. know who he was. No, oh no. man. But once I found out, I took, oh, a, yeah, I took a screenshot of it and put it on my. Uh, my Facebook. That's why they were like, "That's crazy." That's really uh, cool. All the members of the Peterson follow family. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Donald Trump Jr., Scott Adams. Donald Trump Jr. follows you. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit! Wow. It's, it's it's you know it's a uh, I I have now I wish I could tell people I know exactly why these people like me. Mm. I got no idea, right? I can't yeah. trans, because I'm not transmitting what I think is a is a better than winning personality <laughs> via yeah. t- via these tweets. But what I am putting out is, you know, my experience and my, I, th- I, th- I think I'm authentic. I certainly I definitely am, not, not false. Uh, so these people, when they follow me, I just go, cool, man. Like, like a lot of times I wish there was a way to see how many like people with a blue check mark follow me. Cause every now and then, mm-hmm. because here's what Twitter does. Whenever, whenever someone with a blue check mark or a high follower count, follows you or, or or interacts with you for your follow interacts mm-hmm. with you whether they like your tweet or retweet it uh you get forced notified yeah all right and so i'll get a notification i'm like who is this person and then i look and i go wow that's cool man Hell it's yeah. crazy all these people follow me yeah oh uh, what's his name uh david Ayer uh he w- follows me and if you don't know who that is right Cause look man you're not supposed to know who all these you are <laughs> right right he's the guy who, who wrote and directed training day and oh, oh really so, yeah the, the awesome guy um uh, and, and he actually he he bought my well, he he messed with me a few times he went, one when he bought my book about <laughs> sobriety because he talked about i guess he had the same issues okay um and bought it and, and resonated and he also goes oh man no wonder why like you have the same birthday i was like okay no shit <laughs> So he wished me happy birthday on my birthday. I was like, "Oh man, cool, thanks." Yeah, that's so awesome. that's crazy, man. So yeah, you know, we live in we live in this world where if if you have, I think, a valuable thing to say and a valuable yep. message, message, people can relate to. Yeah, and, and you know, and now I think a lot of it too is is I, <clears throat> I think I'm a great communicator, right? You know, yeah. you know, I try and you know, better than average, average, moderate, right? No, I think I'm a great communicator and mm-hmm. and a great. A writer and I think that really helps 
with a lot of people connect and follow me and mm-hmm. retweet my stuff and find me. And then I'm able to like take that and put it in other platforms yeah. and get on my list and my website and all that. But the whole idea, the whole point of me bringing that up is I think that if you have something to say and you work on how you say it, we live in a great world where you Definitely. can share that and connect with other like-minded people. I'm only in Florida because of the Twitter connections I made. Right. Right. So, and, and, and right. So those are the two parts. And then the other third part is what I was saying at the beginning. If you live life, if you have something valuable to say and give an experience and it ain't gotta be something crazy, you know, mm-hmm. people here's, here's a blow your mind. Right. We talked about the boxing and, and to many people that would be that thing. Yeah, makes you famous. Right? right, right, right. But let me tell you something. When I lost my fight and and effectively disappeared from uh, that level of notoriety, I only mm-hmm. had seven thousand followers. Wow, at the <laughs> peak of your boxing. <laughs> wow. This has all been done since then via my writing, via what I say, my speaking, and everything I no do. Way. And so that that lets me know, right? You know, I'm talking about some real time feedback. Right. What should you do with your life? That lets me know. That I I have <clears throat> something unique to offer. People see something unique, and it makes and and I would be I would be foolish to not take advantage of it. This is the decision I I made uh, my final year of school when I and my, and my final when I was thirty of thirty three. Right, mm-hmm. when I got I said you know I don't have the personality to. Work in a lab. Or rather, it was more I don't have the personality to be behind the scenes. Very much, uh, you know, MBTI, whether you think it's it's trash or not. Uh, my MBTI is ENTJ, and I fit that to a T, both positive and negative. You're what? Uh, ENTJ, extroverted, intuitive. Uh, man, I can't even remember. Uh, oh, all of it, judgment. okay. But, but yeah, you, it, some people know what it is, some people won't, right? Okay. Uh, but very much extroverted, very much interested in interacting with people. And so all of the jobs I saw that my career path was taking me down, they were not that. And so I was like, all right, whatever, not interested. And then uh, that explains why I love the teaching. I get in mm-hmm. front to talk and communicate with people. I mean, I really love tutoring. I continued it longer than I had to. Like I started, it started as a thing I needed to do for money, and it ended with me going, well, I really like this, but at this point it costs more of my money and time to go than than it's worth. Like it's it, it was right. not it very much was a side thing that I was having fun with doing. And and I, I find these this 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 communication. I get so much out of it. There's something about sitting here connecting with people, people or? and connecting <clears throat> and then however my brain works, I think I'm very good at explaining things and all these things really come together and I say half joking. 40% joking. Half 40%. The Twitter was really made for people like me that yeah. I can sit and write. And then on top of that, I can start a blog. And I you know it's funny. I've, I've gone back over my writing. And I see how I've gotten better and better and better progressively. Yeah. Better able to express the same idea with fewer words. My word economies improve. My word choices improve. And I continue to sharpen it up because that's what I love to do. People are like, man, why don't you start a YouTube channel? I'm like, yeah, but then I got to do a YouTube channel. Like, not interested. I want to write. I want to write. I yeah. want to communicate with that 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 method, you know. That's cool. And have a good time. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. People are, are different in the way they like to communicate on social media. Like, like Instagram and Twitter are so different. Yeah. Like, there's some people who just, like, love posting pictures and being vague about things. And there's right. people who love like just all day fucking tweet, 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 talking about things, like what they feel, what they, like a cool quote they saw. Right. I think it's a, uh, <laughs> it's interesting to be able to do both. I mean, you got to be able to, to, cause like you're, if you're a visual thinker or a visual communicator versus. And it's a, it's a great challenge because now the next thing I was like, okay, I'm doing well on Twitter. Yeah. Let me try Instagram out. Right. Yeah, but yeah. Pretty much. I'm, I'm trying to avoid a thing that is going to require a huge investment of my time, like putting together a channel. So I was like, let me do Instagram. Hmm. And I'm having a lot of fun with that. I, I passed uh, 10K, so now I can send people back to my website. Oh, nice. <laughs> via my stories. But I'm having a lot of fun with that. But what, it, what it's taught me is that words do one thing. Pictures do another thing. Mm-hmm. And if you want to, if you can, the, the more things you can do, the more options you have. Yeah. And if you are, and I can really figure, I can, I can learn the whole, because look, the whole hashtag system, figured it out. Well, I didn't figure it out, but like realize it's, it's nothing more than an SEO. Um, yeah. The SEO, I did just applied 
to a thing. You know, the more followers you have, the more hashtags you can rank, or rather, hashtags have a certain number of posts uh, right, right. attached to them. And the more followers you have, the more likely you are to rank if you put something in that hashtag. Mm-hmm. And each post has a finite amount of like outlink energy based on outlink energy. That's. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, I guess outlink that. points, you know, like, like you can only put so many links on a website before each individual link loses yeah. its ability to uh, be a follow link and get you SEO points. Mm-hmm. Same idea with IG, right? So, so really understanding this, right? It becomes more deliberate. I'm not just hashtagging for, oh, I think this is cool. Hashtag, you know, goals, hashtag this. Right, no, right. Some people have a freaking hundred thousand right? hashtags on their yeah. posts. Right, so it goes. Oh no, let let's pick something a little smaller. Where I can get on front page of that based yeah. on the things that people are following, and it turns into a really fun game. These these, these games of connection are, are really interesting to me. Do you yeah. uh, for Instagram? Do you screenshot your tweets and post them on Instagram? I used to. That's and a that, hack, dude. And, and, that works good for me at least. Really? Yeah. Maybe you know, maybe I should get back to it. I don't yeah, know. you got to do that, man. The hash the the screenshots from Twitter to Instagram. That's you know what I've been doing. I've been sending them to my stories, and then. But I think oh, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll probably get some more out of it. Oh yeah. Because on the one end, you talk to these pros who run these these agencies. Well, I'm I'm learning them when someone says they run yeah. an agency. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. I, I, look, well, here's the biggest sign for me. If you tell me you run an agency and your Twitter account is smaller exactly. than mine, then I I can't like like I can't listen to you. Like <laughs> yeah. you know, that, like, like I, I do a lot of stuff helping people grow their Twitter. And I can do it because there's just not going to be many people more who have more followers than me, right? Mm-hmm. Even if I was full of shit, which I'm not, but even if I was, they're not, well, they're going to look at my follow count to, and the, the ratio as well. I was like, okay. They're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, we got it. We have to at least listen to this guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, they can't just write me off. But, but I get yeah. guys write me. They're going, you know, I, I, here's a thing, you know, and we do this and we do that and mm-hmm. we, we help these accounts. And I look and I go, yeah, man, but you got like 900 followers, bro. Like, what about, well, how are you going to help me get to where I'm trying to go? Now, yeah. I'm working with one group now, and, and the people who reached out to me, okay, I see you've done the thing that you say that you can do for me. Mm-hmm. So I see that you walk the. You walk the walk. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know, yeah. so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Hell yeah, man. <laughs> Well, cool. I think we're about to hit your time limit here. We're about an a hour and a half in. Awesome, man. This is so, fun. Yeah, I, where can people find your stuff? Where can they watch your videos, read your read your books? Oh, my videos. That, that's all of oh, the videos. YouTube. <laughs> but uh, read my books. You know, just put my name, Ed Lattimore, on Amazon, and you'll see them. It was really smart about it. Or, or rather, I'm really fortunate that I have the name Ed Lattimore, and no one beat me to it. I feel, <laughs> I feel bad for the guy. Who comes up next? Who wants to use Ed Lattimore? Because my website is edlattimore.com. Nice. My Instagram is Ed Lattimore. My Twitter is Ed Lattimore. My no problem. Facebook your name. page is Ed Lattimore. And very simple, too, right? The only trouble is that, like, the way Lattimore is pronounced, yeah. whereas I would spell, some people put two T's in there. Nope. I'm one T, Ed Lattimore. And Ed Lattimore.com. Ed Lattimore.com. Ed Lattimore Instagram. Ed Lattimore on Twitter. Hell yeah, man. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much for coming out here and uh, sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and your stories. It's been fun. I really appreciate this, man. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure. Yes, sir.